bird and then we will get started one second here all right take it away script check bedroom politics written by ben koch fade in interior cleveland public auditorium day hundreds of whooping supporters throng the floor and balcony red white and blue bunting drips from the rafters Posters proclaim Livingston for America. On stage, Victoria Livingston, 50s, whips the crowd into a frenzy. Elegant and charismatic with a Texas twang. Some say elections are about ideas, and some say they're about hope. I say they're about you. Like a conductor, she rouses the crowd to crescendo. With your help, we will ensure that the new horizon dawns on our great nation for four more years. She glories in the adulation as the crowd cheers on four more years, but glory can only last so long. Now, please welcome my husband, the President of the United States, James Livingston. Buoyed by the feverish reception, President James Livingston, 60s, decades of anxious vote counting etched on his craggy face, bounds to the mic, pecks his wife's cheek. Thank you, Cleveland. Victoria, isn't she amazing? The crowd agrees. Victoria salutes them. For a Republican. <laughs> oh, awkward laughter all around. Except for Victoria. She leans into the mic. You married me. The crowd goes bonkers. Exterior Cleveland Public Auditorium Day. Police barricades corral poster-waving supporters near the back exit. News cameraman jostle for position. Polite applause as Secret Service agents escort the president outside. Behind him, for Victoria, the crowd erupts. The president's security detail shuffles him to his limo, past outstretched hands, eager for even the slightest touch. But Victoria lingers, joins her fans' selfies, despite Secret Service efforts to extricate her. Near the limo, a woman with baby thrusts her child at the president. Everyone lights up, everyone but the president. Nevertheless, he accepts the infant and dutifully kisses her chubby cheek. Her bright smile trembles into wails. Oh. From the back row, Arisa Thompson, 30s, striking, vivacious, wrestles her way towards the barricade. Mr. President! Mr. President! Over the baby's crying, he hears Arisa, recognizes her. Victoria rescues him, bundles the bawling infant into her arms. The baby stops crying, giggles. The crowd cheers. The president continues to limo. James! Victoria returns the baby to her mother. She turns to leave, but Arisa seizes her arm. He said he would help us. A Secret Service agent pries Victoria free and hustles her to the limo. Others detain Arisa. Talk to him, please. Interior Presidential Limo Day, campaign manager Carter Lamb, 40s, a professional yes man, scoots over as the president slides into the back seat. Gotta give it to her. First ladies like fine wine. Better with age. Better or bitter? <laughs> it's my fault, sir. There's not only so there's only so many times I could tell her no before she wore me down. <laughs> it was inevitable, wasn't it? Today just whetted her appetite. Why is that a bad thing? Maybe we should consider letting her No. The lemon door open. But she had her day of fun. Victoria takes her seat opposite them. What was that all about? Campaign crazies. <laughs> More every day. She acted like she knew you. The president stares out the window. Everyone knows the president. But what did she mean? The president changes the subject. Now that that's out of your system. You saw how they react to me. They'd cheer for a scarecrow. Ohio is a gift wrapped in a bow. Taking the president's cue. It's in the bag. She considers her husband's demeanor. He's serious. Then send me to Texas. The president eyes her skeptically. It's all upside. Blue cities, Mexican-Americans. Don't vote. Republicans do. They vote Republican. They'll listen to me. He prompts Carter. Democratic Texas is a demographer's fantasy. How long's it been? The funeral? As far as they're concerned, you're a tumbleweed swept down the trail. I served three terms. Um, we're up by... He appeals to Carter. Twelve. Twelve. I know you missed the game, but 
You can't be running all over. Exterior White House Day. Summer shines on the noble monument to American power. You got, you've got important responsibilities at home. Interior White House Flower Shop Day. Assistant florists design stunning bouquets, wreaths, and centerpieces at each workstation. The head florist guides Victoria through endless options before finally stopping at a centerpiece. The Victorians considered orange blossom a symbol of fruitful marriage. I think this would quite suit the dinner's theme, don't you? Why is the White House doing flowers for Hammer's event? Because he has nicely. Don't worry, he's paying. Victoria waves okay. The florist affixes a post-it note and moves on. These are quite beautiful. She turns to find Victoria glued to her cell phone. Don't you think? Uh, very. The florist applies a post-it, meanders across the room. And these are? A glance reveals Victoria texting, hasn't moved. Deadly poisonous. One whiff. It's good night, Mr. President. Forever. But Victoria's attention doesn't waver. That is, until her phone delivers thrilling news. She points to the deadly poisonous arrangement. You outdid yourself, Shirley. And bolts. The floor slaps on a post-it. Interior White House Oval Office Day. The president strikes a golf ball across the ornate carpet. Straight into the auto-return gadget. Pop. And back to him. Look, I'm not going to torpedo my agenda so some two-bit Idaho lip tugger can get a sound bite. A meeting of his domestic policy council, 15 members including the secretaries of agriculture and education, both 50s and the assistant for domestic policy, 30s. I don't see why we can't throw him a bone. Which is why you sit on that side of the desk. Victoria charges in, bubbling over. Gentlemen. By instinct, all rise. All but Chief of Staff Leon Minetti, 50s, loyal and blunt. He checks his daily schedule. I don't see you on the calendar today, ma'am. Perhaps you'd wait. It's not a suggestion. She works the room instead. Hi, hey, how's Angie? Uh, the president eyes Leon. Humor her, briefly. Same old. Won't stop talking CrossFit. Get a chance to vote this morning? <laughs> no can do. We're in Arlington now. The president puts a beauty to the top of the center of the cup. Pop. How about you, Carl? I registered back home. She surveys the room. Someone has to live in the district. Ma'am, I voted yes. I'm for Miss Wagner. She'll love to hear that. What about your neighbors? Leon clears his throat. <clears> throat> uh, we're all excited for Nora, hon, but mind if we run the country for a sec? She shows him her phone's text. My bill's going to the floor. Your bill, Bill? A flicker of annoyance clouds his face. I've got the votes. Bipartisan. He lines up a putt. Women deserve fair pay. She steps between his ball and the cup. No, don't butt me. I've worked too many years for this. But I can't sign a bill that alienates moderates. Victoria pleads her case to the council. Equal pay for equal work. What would your wives think? Everyone studies the carpet. Leon consults the schedule. James, be brave. If we sweep Congress, there might be some give. Might be. Leon makes for the door. Time's up. Sir, the now roaring ambassador is waiting. Is that even a country? If you hear from Nora, tell her I'll call her tonight. His putt scoots between her feet, straight to the cup. Easier than a windmill obstacle. Pop. Interior White House palm room, day. Victoria scuffs through the sun-drenched room into the residence. Rounding the corner, she bumps into Carter. About Texas. No room in the budget, ma'am. He seeks escape. She cuts him off. My office will pay. Sorry, ma'am. You heard the president. He searches for someone, anyone, to save him. We both know I can deliver Texas. No response. She draws near, inches from his face. Grow some balls. Tell him what he needs to hear. He backs away, intimidated. I I'm uh, late for a meeting, uh, and I forgot my projections. <laughs> Victoria eyes the iPad in his hand. Uh, wrong ones. He scurries back the way he came. 
Interior White House East Wing Conference Room Day. A staffer, young and female, like everyone at the conference table, scrawls event details on a whiteboard. An overhead projector displays a seating chart off a laptop. First Lady's Chief of Staff, Donna Cox, 50s, micromanages the meeting. A swaggering Texan like her boss, but more folksy. Lord have mercy. I don't care how many movies George Clooney and Julia Roberts were in together. Victoria doodles on a legal pad, electoral math, states and votes, all in search of that elusive 270 to win. They don't sit at the same table. Off her look, Marcy Weiss, 20s, Donna's spark plug assistant, swipes the on-screen desktop to a dinner menu. Chef Delimon suggests Arctic char more sustainable than tuna. Victoria flips the page to a list of names. Her pen taps several, settles on Falco, circles it. And you got a wine for that? 2014 Frey Brothers Sauvignon Blanc. Victoria knows this routine by heart. Now, now how about, how dessert? about dessert? Donna doesn't find it funny. Everyone else does. Marcy, let's see the speaker invites. Can this wait? A spreadsheet slides on screen. Texas. Marcy sorts by location and scrolls down. No, no, too small. Stop. Austin, UT commencement. Book it. Marcy bolds the row for University of Texas. Now then, dessert? But first... How's our memo? What memo? Fenora 1207. Marcy displays the memorandum on screen in support of the District of Columbia Statehood Act, H.R. 1207. Good. You vote this morning? First in line. Want me to email to Ledge Affairs? Print it. Give it to Rob Murphy. No one else. Whatever it takes. Got it? Marcy thrusts out her chest. She gets it. Christ in heaven. As Marcy's nearly out the door. And Marcy... Take our name off it. Interior White House First Lady's private office day. Atop the sturdy Teddy Roosevelt desk, a photo of a younger Victoria holding forth on the Senate floor. Inscribed, you're the best. Love, James. Donna scribbles Victoria's new agenda on a notepad. 12.07 UT. And Murphy, you don't pay me enough. I don't pay you at all. If the American taxpayer knew how much free labor they get out of me. Every woman knows all too well. Donna adds to her list. Equal pay. Anything else to keep me from the job I am paid to do? There's more to life than playing hostess and bossing tri -delts. That tickles, Donna. You're a tri -delt. We have a responsibility to James. To the presidency. Priorities. My priority is my family. Got a kid at UT I don't know about? Funny, but still. Carrie in Texas is good for James, and James is good for the country. And who's going to take care of your first lady duties while you're out spreading the good word? Well, Donna, since you asked, into your White House first lady's dressing room dusk. From her second story window, Victoria observes a gardener trim one last rose bush as dark settles over the west wing. Just beyond, in the Oval Office, lights burn bright. Keeping tabs on Papa? U.S. Congressional Delegate Nora Wagner, late 20s, pregnant with Victoria's grandchild and her enormous expectations. Watching his back? Why aren't you home celebrating with Henry? It's just a primary. And a career-making referendum. Nora's not interested in this argument again. You know how he is. He wants everything perfect tomorrow night, especially for his big moneymaker. Donor bite. That's all I'm good for. And a home-cooked meal. Interior White House Family Kitchen night. An informal breakfast nook. News on TV. Nora clears space on the island for the baking sheet of eggplant balls that Victoria snatches from the White House chef. 
Please, ma'am. I can whip up a bechamel in five minutes. I insist. Marinara bubbles on the stove. Go be with Lily and the kids. He resists. She stares him down. He relents. Night, ma'am. Miss Wagner? He leaves. Acts like I never cooked before. It's my recipe. She rummages through the pantry. Where does he keep the damn nutmeg? Mama is okay. Henry makes red sauce. I taught myself to like it. Fine. Set the table. Nora obeys. On TV, a report on passage of D.C.'s statehood referendum. Sometimes it's easier to convince half a million than 51. And so it begins. No one's going to hand it to you. You have to fight for your voice. Nora rolls her eyes, perfected over long years of practice. I have a voice, Mother. But not a vote. Falco will deliver the Senate if you deliver Transcore. A non-voting freshman is going to broker an impassable bill? This is Washington, not Hollywood. You're chewing to chair the subcommittee. After you make a few calls. After you get your vote. Talk to Falco. It's good business to have friends in the house. Eye rolling isn't enough. Nora employs the gays. Yeah, that's why my constituents struggled and for 130 years. So one day they could be represented by some senator's puppet. Nora, honey, you're closer than anyone's ever been. But if you don't get that ball across the line, that's it. No one elects a loser. Thanks for the vote of confidence. She finishes setting the table. The TV catches Victoria's eye. That woman from the rope line. She turns up the volume. On TV, breaking news. Over DC newscaster's shoulder, a graphic of Arisa. That Arisa Thompson had sexual relations with President Livingston. She says he promised her. In the kitchen, Nora's stunned, desperate to share her pain. She's lying. Has to be. Victoria is displeased, but not surprised. You knew? Victoria turns the TV off. Jesus, how could you? The president swings into the kitchen. How could you what? You. Victoria transforms into the consummate politician. How could I serve eggplant balls without bechamel? Nora, distraught, cannot comprehend her mother. Sweetie, it's just sauce. Or hormones? He kisses his daughter. She flinches. Kidding. You gotta learn to keep your cool now that you're queen of D.C. She's just a non-voting freshman, right? Nonsense. You're bringing them into our American family. That's historic. He notes the table setting with dismay. And if I'd known you were coming, I'd had Manny set up the dining room. This felt more appropriate, like the old kitchen on Hickory. Might be the last time we have dinner together, the three of us. Speechless, Nora waddles towards the door. You shouldn't stand so much. He pulls out a chair at the table. Reluctantly, she returns. He helps push her in. I can do it myself. I want you to see Dr. Mora at Bethesda. Dion's got her info. I'm fine. My doctor's great. Mora's the best OB around. Plus, you get the commander-in-chief discount. Leave the poor girl alone. Victoria serves dinner. Nora has no appetite. She eyes her mother. Tell him. Sweden's back in the hospital. Couldn't happen to a better scumbag. I might say that about you someday. Politics is personal. That's not what that means. I'm twice the president he ever was. Why are you defending him? Bastard screwed you more than a two-bit hooker. Wouldn't be the first one. His cell phone vibrates. He reaches. Victoria stops him. Family time. Nora can't even... Grudgingly, he puts the phone down, raises a glass instead. Sonora, 
the founding mother of what's it called? Nora gives him nothing. New Columbia. Right. I'll have to work on that. To New Columbia. And Nora's continued success. Nora refuses to toast with them. Get this girl some white sauce. I told her to talk to Falco. Now it makes sense. We have better things to discuss. But her shaky voice is too slight to derail her parents. You don't need Falco. You want your bill passed? Trust your gut. Speaking of bills, you ought to reconsider mine. He smiles innocently. Family time. Nora supports it, don't you? I think all women should be treated with respect. The president's cell rings. Victoria be damned, he answers. One perk of office I don't miss. He listens. His smile melts away. Hangs up. I have to go. What's going on? Is it Nauru? That does it. Nora musters her courage. Who? Who is she? Realizing he's been had, the president glares at Victoria. Did you get a kick out of that? Dragging Nora into your games? And you played along? As outraged as Nora feels, his disappointment cuts deeper. I didn't. It wasn't. You made her a promise you can't keep. Her matter-of-fact tone dumbfounds Nora. How should I know this one will be a blabbermouth? This one? Victoria scrapes her plate into the garbage disposal. It's the first rule of politics. Everyone's a blabbermouth when they want something. You wrote the book on that. You should read it sometime. For Nora, it's finally starting to sink in. So what? You just let him? It's not that simple. Nora swivels from one parent to the other, trapped in a vacuum of anger, deceit, and humiliation. Is this some kind of poly kink thing? No. Tell it to your other daughter, the one who cares. Her parents wince. Because whatever this is, is... I, I don't want any part of it. She storms out. Nora. Have many make up the Lincoln. Victoria, listen. Good night. She dumps his food into the sink. Interior White House Lincoln bedroom, day. A portrait of Honest Abe watches over Victoria. Sound asleep in the 19th century bed. Sunlight streams across puffy eyes. She wakes, sweeps aside crumpled tissues on the nightstand to check the clock. Shit. Interior White House Lincoln bedroom later, Victoria, made up and dressed, opens the door. And then in the East Sitting Hall, yellow and breezy, inviting guests to sit a spell. Carter fidgets with a newspaper. Victoria enters. He springs to his feet. Morning, ma'am. We need to talk. Sure you got time for me today? He shrinks into his suit. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I'm very sorry. The president is, too. He must have really put him in his place if he's too scared to face me. He's not scared. Oh. <laughs> Sarcasm. He tries again. Ma'am, we need a strategy. Newspapers arranged on the coffee table. Every headline blasts the president's cheating. This isn't going away. Why would it? No one's ever questioned the underlying principle of his profession before. It's deeply unsettling. Yes. Uh, no. Of course, ma'am. Uh, but the numbers, it could cost him. She strides towards the staircase. He scuffles behind. You do know it's illegal to campaign in the White House. Flop sweat beads on his brow. I'm not campaigning. If you say so. Interior White House Grand Staircase, continuous Victoria leads Carter down two red carpeted flights. If you could maybe uh, be like Hillary. I mean, she stood by Bill. Look where that got her. They descend in silence while he renews his courage. Please, ma'am, uh, stick with him. At least through the election. And if I don't? He chooses his words carefully. The campaign's at a delicate stage. I thought we were up 12. This is 
everything you've worked for. The president needs you. Interior White House Center Hall continuous, they emerge into the long vaulted hallway. He's got a funny way of showing it. Inside the First Lady's office, her staffer's office functional and workaday, usually. Today, a whirlwind of manic activity. No comment. I can't answer that. Why, yes, I can be very naughty. Slams the phone down mid-reply. Deep breath. Reporters are creepy, blood-sucking, perverted leeches. That's Cosmo for you. Just wait till Marie Claire calls. Marcy throws her hands up. There's got to be something we can do. What we always do. Keep oil flowing. When my ex cheated on me, I cried a week. Then I stole his girlfriend. Good thought, but she's not my type. Time stands still. No one's sure what to do or say until... I'll be damned if anyone's hard-earned paycheck is spent on you slackers ogling the first lady. Now pick your jaws off the ground and get to work. And like that, activity resumes. How are you? We don't have time for that. Donna takes her aside. No one would blame you to lay low. I'll never hear the end of it. So you'd rather they say you caved? Good little wife doing his bidding. Or call me courageous and resolute. Donna doubts that. Excuse me, ma'am. Mr. Minetti's on the phone. He doesn't sound happy. That's just his accent. She picks up the nearest phone. Leon, hold your horses. Ma'am, I'm... I can't... What I'm trying to say... Donna's hard expression commands her to get it together. I'm sorry about everything. Thank you, sweetheart. Did you take care of 1207? Rob Murphy sure took care of her. On Marcy, very funny. Let me guess, Murphy promised to make it worth your while? No worries, I laid down the law. And Texas called. They doubled the honorarium, but I can cancel. Victoria thinks about it. No, you may not. She's busier than a funeral home fan in July. Let's not jump to any rash decisions. Interior White House First Lady's private office day. Victoria closes a file, tosses it atop her inbox, already teeming with paperwork, much like the rest of her desk. She gazes longingly at a cozy couch. On her little TV, C-SPAN shows senators voting on equal pay. Donna tiptoes in with hot tea. Victoria joins her on the couch, two old friends who've been through it all together. Donna slips Victoria a dog-eared divorce lawyer's card. She turns it over and over in her hand, considering. There's so much more to do. Child care, college loans, equal pay. Look how much you've already done. She waves to a bookshelf lined by rows of binders, each labeled with registration titles. One binder faces outward, a gold rising sun stamped on its cover. On this logo is written the New Horizon, like the New Deal or the Great Society. Without you, there wouldn't be a New Horizon. You think James could win over a Republican Senate by himself? Hell, imagine how many more you'd had time to write if Sweeten hadn't vetoed those first. You got nothing to prove. But with four more years... Donna sets her tea down. Four more years of lame excuses why he can't back your bills. Four years of rumors every time an intern's hired. That what you want? I left the Senate for this. So, back to the old stomping grounds. You won three. Why not four? Victoria shakes her head. Here you get things done like that. When he listens to you. Maybe you should be president. You can be first lady. Kill two birds with one stone. They laugh. Victoria lays her head on Donna's shoulder. Interior White House First Lady's private office later. Outside noise wakes Victoria. She's alone on the couch. On TV, C-SPAN's Chiron shows equal pay passing 51 to 49. The hell you will. Not unless you're on the calendar. Leon barges in and shuts Donna out. Ma'am, with all due respect, you can't ignore the president. If he wants to see me so bad, he can come himself. I don't need to remind you, it's your agenda at stake, too. Seems agendas don't matter much to you. If I may be frank, 
Don't stop now. He adopts more conciliatory tone. The optics aren't good. This afternoon, he'll address the press. To deny it all? To apologize. He wants you by his side. Exterior White House Rose Garden Day. A lone podium. The press corpse buzzes with anticipation. Interior White House Oval Office, same. Victoria listens to reporters' indistinct chatter as it seeps through the window. The president lines up a putt. Let's be clear. Seated at the table, a voice in every decision. She turns away from the window. Not just a voice, a vote. And sign equal pay. I got it. He begins his backswing. Don't screw me, James. The ball rattles the cup, but settles. Barely. Pop. Exterior White House Rose Garden Day, they emerge from the Oval Office hand in hand. A hush falls over the press. Victoria models her best political smile. The president kisses her cheek. Cameras flash. Interior White House Oval Office Day, as soon as they return, Victoria drops the president's hand. My bill is... Go on and have to wait, ma'am. Your call with President Salinger is ready in the sit room, sir. He invites her to leave. This is bullshit, Leon. We need to talk. The president picks up his putter, drops a ball. We'll talk at the gala, dear. You didn't cancel? I disappoint, Henry. Interior Washington Hilton Ballroom night, a black tie affair. Despite hundreds of guests, the band plays to an empty dance floor. Above the die, a banner. United families are strong families. Nora dines at the longhead table with her husband, Henry Wagner, 30s. Eternal optimist, her rock and voice of reason. Gotta be at least a billion bucks in those suits and not a wallet in sight. They showed up, didn't they? To see the freak show. I'd never stop P.T. Barnum. At the other end of the table, below the banner, next to the deadly poisonous centerpiece, Victoria and the president endure guests in whispers. Smile. Pretend you enjoy yourself. He dives into his arctic chair. I've had enough of that today. Well, they haven't. Victoria nods to the banner overhead. Henry must be having a fit. What for? He's got a full house at five grand a plate. Because they're too polite to de demand their money back. Maybe they believe in the cause. She snorts. <laughs> so do witnesses do an execution. Or they hope to see us patch up our differences. That's what you call it? He puts down his silver. Let's dance. You're joking. He cues the MC40's a part-time bar mitzvah DJ into Mike. Ladies and gents, I hope you wore your dancing shoes tonight. Don't be bashful. Get your money's worth. They're getting it all right. No takers? <laughs> How about a warm round of applause for the first couple? Yes, the president drags Victoria onto the dance floor. I'll have that bill in the morning. The guests are treated to a rubbernecker's dream. At the head table. Can I make a donation? To leave? Jacob, the families will help him. You'd desert them before dessert? Levels her knife at him. Don't start. Not tonight. Or what? You'll scream? Henry? Before I scream? Henry Wagner, ladies and gentlemen. Unrepentant punster. On the dance floor, other pairs have joined in. The first couple's synergy can best be described as junior high dance. Ooh. Victoria rebuffs the president's efforts to spin her. We used to love to dance. We used to love a lot of things. She follows his lead listlessly around the floor. Give me a chance to set things right. We can make this work. Is that what your pollen says? He dips her into her ear. I'm throwing you a lifeline if you'll just grab the damn thing. I'm not the one swimming with sharks. Always an answer. Someone has to. Exasperated, he tries a different tack. Think how much we can do in four years with a re-election to worry about. If you keep your promise. You're questioning me? You're the one skipping off to Texas next week. She's surprised, he knows. 
It doesn't take the world's most sophisticated intelligence operation to get a copy of your travel schedule. You should be happy I'm campaigning for you at all, considering. I'd be happier if you didn't go behind my back. Must be the White House water. The schools are close. Listen to me. Morris is a two-foot titan. A nobody. We don't need Texas. You're their president, too. Let me... You're not a politician anymore. All around them, necks crane to hear what comes next. James? He lowers his voice. You're the first lady. Your place is the White House. Cancel the trip. I need it. The song ends into the silent void. Like I need your damn bill. All around them, wheels turn in heads. This will make for the best cocktail party story ever. Beautiful round of applause for the President of the United States and, of course, the First Lady. He hands the President the mic, Victoria Simmers. The President scrutinizes the Strong Family's banner. Sure I'm at the right party? Cascading laughter eases the room's tension. We're here tonight in support of a worthy cause. Even the most united families face adversity, and in overcoming it, become stronger. I should know. I have apologized to my family for my transgressions. Nora squirms. But not to all of you. I'm sorry. I hope you'll accept it. From the back, a champ builds. Four more more years. years. Four Four more more years. years. President pumps the mic to the beat. Four more intolerable, powerless years flash before Victoria's eyes. Interior White House Oval Office Day, the president signs his veto message. I am returning herewith, without my approval, S-689, the Equal Pay Act. Four more years. Four more years. Exterior Joint Base Andrews Day, Executive 1 Foxtrot, a Boeing C-32 with the United States of America emblazoned across its fuselage, takes off. Four Four more years. years. Four Four more years. years. Exterior University of Texas Tower Night, Victoria in cap and gown, addresses thousands of jubilant graduates and their families who pack the South Mall. A large screen projects her image to the back of the lawn. And so, my fellow Texans, as you embark on this momentous journey, my advice is simple. Whatever you choose to do with your lives, make yourselves proud. Dream big. She examines the faculty and guests seated behind her. Their admiring expressions fortify her. Four years ago, I resigned my Senate seat to support my husband's dream and to forego my own. Now, what kind of role model would I be if I ignored my own advice? That as we say in Texas, is all hat, no cattle. She basks in the students' cheers, then pauses deliberately. Interior White House President study night. A cramped hideaway with couch, recliner, and desk. The president watches Victoria's address on a small TV. So tonight, I'm here to announce I will seek the Republican nomination for President of the United States. The crowd's roar distorts the TV speakers. In the study, the president's world is rocked. Seconds pass before he regains his senses and hurls the remote, knocking a photo of himself and Victoria off the desk. Interior White House residence night, the president blunders off the family elevator, traipses through the central hall in a stupor. Outside the master bedroom, he finds moving boxes stacked. Bewildered, he tears open a box, his clothes. He tosses aside an undershirt, socks, boxers. A White House butler drops a box on the pile, startling him. Underwear dangling from his finger, the president confronts the butler. His explanation is simple. She tips well. He extends an upturned palm. Cut to exterior United States Capitol Day. Crossing Independence Avenue from the Capitol to the Rayburn Building, a female Washington Post reporter, 30s, interviews Nora, escorted by two Secret Service agents. My constituents are crying out for representation only statehood provides. Did you know she was announcing? For fuck's sake, Anne. You want to talk about my mom? Ask her yourself. 
I'm not gonna get my ass chewed out for another puff piece like it's, like it or not, you're the story. A scruffy tourist dude 20 stops them. Hey, you're the president's daughter. The Secret Service agents steal themselves for action. Washington Post flashes Nora a shit-eating grin. How do you do? Did you, like, no? I mean, for it to be going down? He chuckles, catching his innuendo. In the White House? I bet this dog did. You guys are, like, secret keepers. Area 51 and shit. Nora gapes at him. The agent doesn't react. Well, did you? Salted Nora plows onward to Rayburn. Come on, Nora. She thinks this sucks, balls. Wait till election day. Into your Rayburn House Oversight Committee room day, the chairwoman, 50s, concludes committee business. At the end of the day, die. Lowest ranking member's seat is Nora. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say no. 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 The ayes have it. The bill is ordered for reported favorably to the House without objection, meaning adjourned. She bangs her gavel. Members file off. Nora collects her notes. Two indiscreet, horny congressmen, preppy and fratty Republican 30s, sneak glances at her. She can't help but overhear them. Daddy's girl voted no. Shocker. I'd give her the shocker. She's got nothing on Victoria. You can give me all the cash in the treasury to cheat on her. She's old enough to be your mom. Yeah, she is. Sick. Me, I'd take that Arisa chick for a ride on my Air Force One. He goes for a high five. Am I right? Gets nothing but air. Dude, if leadership heard you, they'll kick you out of the caucus. No way, bro. That's only for banging on a dam. This broad's independent. Trust me, Livingston's a rig freaky fuck. Wants them all in his big tent party. Nora is about to let them have it when... Don't let them ruin your day. What's left to ruin? It's not every day a freshman gets a bill on the calendar. That's news to Nora. Speaker had a nice heart-to-heart -heart with Ledge Affairs this morning. Someone in the White House likes you. The gift that keeps on giving. The chairwoman eases into a reasonable voice. Kid, if I had your connections, I'd be speaker. And I'd congratulate you on your well-earned achievement. Touche. Sue yourself, but get used to shoe leather and grease palms, especially over there. You'll want to start with Senator Falco, of course. Of course. Interior Republican National Convention night. Patriotic bunting bedecks the area. On the floor, garishly attired delegates mill about their state's areas. The image of Victoria high-fiving her way down the center aisle, projected onto giant screens, ignites the convention. Victoria! 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 Interior Republican National Convention backstage, same, a drab cinder block hallway in which whiny feet, Governor Morris 60s waves a rule book at the wall mounted CCTV. Don't let her horn swaggle you. I want these delegates fair and square. RNC Chairman 50s, for whom the title isn't worth the hassle, snatches the book away. I promise there's nothing in here she can use. Now let's get my, let's get you nominated before I change my mind. The stage door opens, deafening Victoria. Chance, proceed the swaggering hero herself. Governor, Mr. Chairman. You ain't gonna steal my election. In this country, we follow the rules. If it weren't for rule breakers, we wouldn't have a country. She points to the frenzied delegates on CCTV. Can't ignore the will of the people. I wish it were true. You what? But we have primaries and caucuses for a reason. I won't see my convention 
degenerate into chaos. RNC chairman exits. Morris gloats. I'm all tore up making you go back to the head good for nothing husband. If it's small consolation, I'll whoop his ass. No one whoops his ass but me. Interior Republican National Convention night. Victoria commandeers the Texas delegation's floor mic. This is Victoria Livingston. The delegates roar, shakes the arena. Interior Republican National Convention sound booth same. A tiny room with a massive soundboard. Marcy, now staffing Victoria's campaign, slips a $100 bill to the board op, 30s. He's mesmerized by her smile. Interior Republican National Convention moments later, Morris sprints up the mic amid the crowd's wild cheering. Cut her off! And back in the sound booth, his eyes fixed on Marcy's. Board op reaches for a button. She peels off another 100. His hand backs away. Moments later, Morris has only managed to piss off the delegates. Let, Let her, her speak. speak. Let, Let her, her speak. She has no right. The rules say... Oh, his mic cuts out. Interior Republican National Convention sound booth. Marcy offers board operator another hundred, but he's interested in something else. She tucks the bill into her bra, brushes a sexy finger against her puckered lips, and leaves him breathless. Morris screams into the void, pounds the mic vainly, giant screams magnifying his hissy fit for all the world to see. Words can't express how much I value your support and your votes. The delegates rejoice. Uh, in the RNC later on the floor, an Arkansas delegate flaunts a gaudy sequin jacket and Victoria buttons pinned to her boater. Into Mike. Arkansas awards all 40 votes to the next president of the United States, Victoria Livingston. The delegates cheer. On the die, RNC chairman consults the rule book. Into Mike. Pursuant to Republican Party Rule 16A2, Arkansas's 40 votes are not recognized. The delegates, boo! They will be awarded as pledged to Governor Morris, California. A California delegate as flamboyant as Arkansas's into Mike. California, the golden state, land of fun and sun, where the West was won, second to none, awards 12 votes to Governor Morris. The delegates sigh and hiss. And 160 to the next president of the United States, Victoria Livingston. The delegates rave. Pursuant to Republican Party Rule 16A2, California's 160 votes are not recognized. Their booze drown him out. Interior Republican National Convention bear. later, confetti, bear. confetti and balloons cascade from the rafters. On stage, Morris and his wife raise their hands in victory. Victoria! Victoria! Interior RNC backstage night, Victoria and RNC chairman marvel at the booming chance penetrating cinder block. This is a travesty, and you know it. He hands her a thick petition for independent candidates, overflowing with signatures. Best I can do. I was born Republican. I'll die Republican. He signs and peels off a personal check made out to the Independent Committee to elect Victoria Livingston. Me too. Interior, uh, interior Stately Mansion Day, a floor sign welcomes guests to the Independent Committee to elect Victoria Livingston kickoff gala. The scent of money oozes from the walls. A female donor, 30s, hippie-ish, commands Victoria's attention. Other women, eager for FaceTime, hover nearby. Republicans won't do a damn thing about it. Not as long as they're cashing in citizens and do not at checks. Exactly, and you'd never veto a bill that helps half the country. That's why I need your support. Charlotte and Tilly, both 70, spinster, spinster busybodies, shoehorn into the conversation. Maybe we can be of service. Charlotte Tillerson, the Charlotte Tillerson's chair of the Women's League. Tilly clears her throat. <clears throat> and Tilly Sinclair, my vice chair. The pleasure is mine. We didn't want to make too much fuss, but we'd be honored if you'd accept our Woman of the Year prize. Tilly awards Victoria a lucite plaque inscribed Victoria Livingston, Women's League Woman of the Year. I'm touched. Now, let's have a photo. 
Tilly shoes female donor out of frame. Charlotte thrusts half the plaque into Victoria's hands. Just wait till the Kiwanis see this newsletter. Gives me ghost flesh. After the photo. As I was saying, we can't imagine a more appropriate representation of the challenges modern women face. Tilly agrees. Mm -hmm. We especially appreciate the spirit you've shown standing up to that liberal critic, Cretan, Cretan, your husband. You are too kind, and I will cherish this award. But I'll tell you what would really help is if she'd write my campaign a check. Charlotte and Tilly exchange glances, burst into laughter. <laughs> Heavens no, we're Republicans. We can never support an independent. You don't stand a chance, dearie. Victoria keeps her composure. Then why are you here? We had to see for ourselves if what the Inquirer says is true. Victoria offers her practice political smile. Well, thank you for your support. Oh, I never donate to people causes. Only animals. They don't ask for anything in return. Enjoy the party. She finds Donna now her campaign manager, hands her the award. Think we can pawn this? That good, huh? We need to make some noise. Publicity ain't the problem. Publicity is catnip to money. A liveried, liveried uh, waiter offers caviar and creme fraiche tartlets on a silver platter. Ooh la la. Donna takes two. Well, I just got a call that'll buck you up. Sweeten's dead. He pops one in her mouth. Shame. Sing Grace Flowers. Donna's eyes roll further back in, in her head with each chew. Mm. Lord almighty. We cannot afford these. She offers Victoria the other. Enjoy. Donna polishes it off with vigor. You gotta go out of the question. You don't have a choice. The first lady always has a choice. Not when it's a state funeral. For that shit, hell. Mm -hmm. Interior Washington National Cathedral Day. A flag draped casket graces the crossing. Rows of mourners line the nave. Widow Sweeten, 80s, sits in the front row. A few seats away, Victoria. TV cameras broadcast it all. At the pulpit, the eulogist in chief. Throughout his life, in good times and bad, Calvin Sweeten could always count on Grace, his constant companion, to stand by his side. Widow Sweeten remembers. When she testified in his trial for bribery, graft, and extortion, Grace never once betrayed him. When he was impeached, she did not falter. When he boarded that lonely flight home to Iowa, it was Grace who comforted him. Tears trail down Widow Sweeten's distraught face. Victoria smothers seething anger. No president was more fortunate than Calvin Sweeten to have a first lady like Grace, his rock and foundation. Interior Washington National Cathedral later, an Oregon recessional signal services end. Widow Sweeten's grieving daughter, 50s, helps her stand, passing Victoria. Very sorry for your loss. Thank you, ma'am. Here we are, Mom. She angles Widow Sweeten away from Victoria, only to be cornered by the president. Your father was a brave man, a towering figure in our history. Victoria could gag. In his wildest dreams, he never expected to lie in state. Why not? He lied everywhere else. Excuse me? It's a travesty the way Congress treated him. Pardon us. He seeks to escape, but the Livingstons hold their ground. He fleece the treasury. And you impeached him. I didn't impeach him. I was being figurative. Daughter Sweeten urges her mother forward. Excuse us. Nowhere. Well, the Constitution's not. The House impeached him. You removed him. Satisfied? He caused financial panic. 
because you were too busy digging up dirt to do your job. Widow Sweeten begins to tremble. Please. I was one person out of a hundred. When did that ever stop you? Move! The President and Victoria are too far gone to care. You canceled his Secret Service detail and pension. Well, I gave the crooked bastard this, didn't I? To spot me. It's not always about you. Widow Sweeten is a blubbering mess. Shame on the both of you. Interior Nor in Henry's townhouse living room day. A Bew Arts revival in Washington's Tony Calorama district. On TV, the funeral confrontation captured in all its glory. Grace, I beg your forgiveness. My wife wouldn't recognize compassion if it fucked her in the ass. Widow Sweeten faints. In the living room, Nora rewinds the fiasco on her DVR. Henry clomps downstairs holding two baby crib mobiles. Which one? He sees what she's watching again. Gotta stop doing this to yourself. I'm adopted. No other explanation. It's not good for the baby. The baby's the least of my problems. He puts down the mobiles, falls into the couch with her, accidentally hitting the remote's channel change, playing the goofball. Cheer up, Charlie. She can't help but smile. He mischievously slides his hands into her armpits and tickles. She squirms, laughing. Stop! Stop! His fingers dance across her body. Unless you want my water to break here, on the couch. He pauses dramatically, then renews his assault. Give me that baby. In tears, convulsing, panting. Lion King! Lion King! He stops, considers the little Simbas on one of the mobiles. Hmm, not giraffes? She shakes her head, catches her breath. Don't think lion will get you off the hook. He flexes his fingers, eager for more, when a campaign ad grabs their attention. Nora Wagner thinks she knows what's best for you. On TV, Nora's photo. And why wouldn't she? She served two whole years as our congressional delegate, but a delegate... The photo dissolves into a black and white negative. ...is not a representative. A U.S. map replaces the photo. Cartoon Nora lugs large carpet bags eastward from California. Because a carpet bagger can't represent Washington Washingtonians or our values. Halfway, a convertible driven by her cartoon parents picks up Cartoon Nora. They hightail it to Washington. She's a Livingston, after all. The daughter of a man who disrespects his wife and his office. Cartoon president waves and a woman who betrays her husband's trust and her party. Cartoon Victoria waves. It's a disgrace. Our next president will be one of these two ingrates. Three cartoons dance a circle around the White House. So friends and neighbors, let's send the Livingstons a message the rest of the nation only wishes it could send. The voice belongs to Chuck Rooney, 50s, pompous and brash standing in front of a wrought iron fence. You have a choice this November. A hard-working native, 20 years on the DC Council fighting your fights, or my opponent, the silver spoon heir to a corrupt political dynasty. When you hold that ballot in your hand, ask yourself. He reveals a red apple. Does the apple fall far from the tree? He tosses it over his shoulder onto the White House lawn. I'm Chuck Rooney, and I approve this message. In the living room, Nora and Henry gape slack-jawed at the screen. The baby's definitely the least of our problems. Prelap, jackhammering. Interior hotel room night. Victoria bolts upright, fumbles for the lamp. Her eyes flit about. She catches her breath, forces open the window. Below, a road crew bathed in lamplight. It's three in the goddamn morning! A hard hat waves at her. She can't hear over the noise. She slams the window shut. Exterior train station day. The observation car window slides open as the antique train steams into the station. Victoria waves to admirers hoisting Victoria signs who crowd the platform. Victoria! Victoria. 
She merges onto the car's open deck to more cheers into Mike. Anyone who says they want four more years of James Livingston has never lived with James Livingston. Her fans, whoop! He takes credit for our economy. He holds a loft a checkbook. But who balances the family checkbook? Explain to me again why women don't make the same as men. On the platform, a donor gives Donna a check. Exterior road day. Carter gives a road crew foreman cash. Interior, a different hotel room night. Jack hammering rattles the windows. Victoria presses a pillow to her head. She flings it aside, revealing heavy-duty construction earmuffs. She stumbles to a window. Across the street, a lamp-lit billboard proclaims James Livingston, leadership for America, loud and clear. Victoria scrabbles about, finds a high heel, opens the window, and heaves it at the crew below. It flutters harmlessly to the ground. The foreman waves. Exterior State Fairgrounds, day. From a bandstand in a meadow, Victoria rallies supporters. Who do you think got him elected? You, you did. Backstage, Donna collects checks from donors. That's right. And take it from me, it's not just on the campaign trail that he overpromises and underdelivers. The crowd hoots. In the meadow, two moms, late 20s, sporting Victoria buttons, laugh at her joke. Two young children play tag. Oh my God, that totally reminds me. I got this crazy call asking if I'd known that Nora's daddy ain't Livingston. So funny. Georgia told us at Bixby she heard Victoria hooked up with President Sweeten. A man in the crowd distributes coloring books. I could see that. I know, right? It's the eyes. Totally. Wait, y'all went to Bixby's without me? Mommy, look what I got. In his coloring book, a drawing of Victoria wearing monarch's robe and crown. Constitution uh, strutted at her feet, gleefully taking a machine gun to Congress. He thrust out his greedy hand. Crayons. Another child mows down the crowd with his imaginary machine gun. Rat-a-tat-tat, rat-a-tat-tat-tat. Interior a third hotel room night, silence. Victoria's earmuffs lie on the nightstand. She peers out the window at a brick wall. Satisfied there's no construction crew below, she slips into bed. Later, loud knocking. Victoria jolts awake. The clock reads 3.17 a.m. This better be an emergency. She clambers out of bed and jerks open the door. Secret Service stands by as a room service waiter wheels in steaming domed plates. He reveals filet, lobster, duck. You gotta be kidding. He hands her a bill for $270. Electoral votes, a sad joke. 270. Children. Shall I charge it to the room? Interior NBA Arena night. The crowd pulses like a rock concert. Victoria evangelizes. I've crossed this great land and I've heard you loud and clear. You want a president with balls. Yeah. Sorry to say, I don't have balls. You do. Don't need him. And neither does my husband. A roar crashes wall to wall. Why else would he wear these? She tosses a hot pink men's bikini brief into the crowd. If he had balls, he'd admit he's a fraud. He'd tell you the New Horizon was my idea. Each and every one of those wonderful laws that makes your lives better, me. The crowd agrees. He'd tell you he doesn't want me in this race. Why? Because there's so much more than the New Horizon he doesn't even know about. Because it's all right here. She taps her head. But he won't tell you any of that, and I'm sick of it. With each declaration, the crowd bays its approval. I'm sick of the disrespect, the condescension, the betrayals, and I know you are too. The crowd rises to fever pitch. James, it's time you admit it. The only thing you have to fear is me. Victoria. 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 Say it again. Victoria. Victoria. Backstage, Donna stuffs donations wherever she can. Exterior highway day. 
On the roadside, a rickety tour bus, Morris for America, nurses a flat. Its driver leans against the bumper, enjoying a cigarette. Cars fly by, uncaring. Morris, sweat soaking through his suit, pries the rubber off the wheel with a tire iron. Secret Service agents watch. It begins to rain. Exterior Washington, D.C. TV, TV station day. Secret Service escorts Nora and Henry across the courtyard. Relax, you'll be great. I'm not worried. Bullies fold when you strike first. That's what gung-ho dads tell their disappointed little kids. He stops her. You'd rather let him belittle you? Why shouldn't he? I'm the poster child for nepotism. No, you're a wagner. You make your own fate. And antagonize him more? He's got enough red meat. Mama, Mom and Papa made sure of that. People need to see him for what he is. He strides towards the building. Nora lags behind. So they feel sorry for me? So they see you stand up for yourself. It's too risky. He halts at the entrance, his hand on the door pull. You can't give him free rein, because when it rains, it pours. Not helping. That's the spirit. Take the fight to him. End it before it begins. He opens the door for her. Interior Washington, D.C. TV station, dusk. Nora and Rooney debate at a news desk in front of a cheap green screen graphics and D.C. newscaster, the moderator. Behind the cameras, Henry paces. So, were you promised the seat before Daddy moved into 1600? Or are you just an opportunist like your mommy? I won fair and square. On your own? <laughs> of course. Wherever would I get such a preposterous idea? Her cheeks flush. I've lived here my whole adult life. And how long is that? Harry's getting agitated. Face it, toots. You're a carpetbagger, and yet you claim to represent us when you've done nothing but carry the president's water. Nora sputters. Our next topic. And don't get me started on helicopter, Mommy. Frankly, I'm surprised she didn't drop you off tonight. Sweat beads on her clammy forehead. I am not my parents. Uh, our next question is for... You're a carbon copy. If I were Mr. Livingston, sorry, Wagner, I'd test that baby's DNA. Henry storms up to Rooney. Say it to my face. Mr. Wagner. Producers scramble to restrain Henry. Henry! Her chest heaves, searching for breath. See? Can't even fight for herself. Henry cold clocks Rooney, toppling him from his seat. Henry. Henry rounds on Nora. What? Doubled over in pain. Call an ambulance. And we're going to break right there. <laughs> all right. Good job, everybody. Cool. We are at the halfway point. So let's all take a five minute break and then we will reconvene. Woo! 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 And for you guys, let us put on a little music.
All right, we are back. Welcome back to Twitch Film Table Reads. Blah, 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 blah. Let's get back to the table read. One second here. Aren't I a good host, guys? Okay, and we are back. I hope you guys had a good five-minute break. Everybody ready to go for part two? Yeah. All yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the enthusiasm. That, 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 felt like, that felt like three and a half minutes. <laughs> yeah, it did. I, you know what? I During that five-minute break, I don't know what you guys did, but I actually washed a couple dishes in preparation of making dinner after this show, and I thought, man, I'm such a nerd. I used my five-minute break to wash dishes. What did you guys do in the five-minute break? I dropped the kids off at the pool. Wow, that was enough time for you? Nice. Impressive. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't get enough time to do that. Very, uh, very fast, kids. I did, however, replenish my snacks, and I also managed to make a cuppa. Uh, okay. And then, and then I found the song. Yeah, a cup of a cup of tea. We'll have to play the song after the show. Script check. I'm glad you fed the cat. Uh, it sounded like he she was hungry. Oh, could you hear him? <laughs> yeah, That's we were so making cute. fun of it. And um, I don't know if you're watching table read chat is where we're talking. Um, we were Sorry, no, I have the yeah. script, but I like shut him out. <laughs> oh, Let that's what in. that was we for. Like him. What's your cat's name? Cagney. Oh, that's. But does anyone name. know? It's not James Cagney. Oh. It's uh, what, what happened to Lacey? Lacey? No, it's not Lacey either. It's my roommate's cat, and she named him after some animated gargoyles cat. Oh, I don't know what. From the from. show Gargoyles. From the show Gargoyles. <laughs> That no one knows. Yeah, I vaguely remember the show, but I don't. Yeah, uh, I don't I remember, remember being a cat on it particularly. Yeah, that that reminds me. I always used to plan on naming my first kid Jagger, but it wasn't after Mick Jagger. It was after Antonio Sabato Jr.'s character on General Hospital. But nobody would know that. Everyone would think it was Mick Jagger, and so I changed my mind. Or mispronounced Jagger. <gasps> Jagger. Okay, anyways, enough small talk. Uh, let's get on with the show. Script check, you ready? Yes, from Georgetown University. Uh, yeah. All right. Into your <laughs> Georgetown University hospital night. Victoria races through the ward, her Secret Service detail hustling behind. Awestruck nurses point down the hall. Into your Nora's hospital room. Nora sleeps and Ivy in her arm. Henry, red puffy eyes, holds her hand. The president slumps in a chair in the corner. If I hadn't lost control. It's not your fault. Nora moans. The president bounds to her side, frantic. What did you do? Nothing. The president flies into the hallway. Doctor. Wait, Nora. What's going on? The doctor, 30s, arrives in a hurry. What's happening? She was moaning. He pushes past, checks the IV, tends to Nora. I'm fine, I'm fine. What about the baby? The doctor scans Nora's chart. Mr. President, I assure you she's in good hands. Fortunately, her preeclampsia isn't severe. The president and Henry are relieved. But you need rest. I don't have time. We'll make time. See that you do. The doctor leaves. You're going to Bethesda. I don't need special treatment. I don't care. It's your child. Victoria hurdles in. Nora, baby, you are right. I got here as fast as I could. I'm fine. Dubious, Victoria seeks Henry's confirmation. She just needs rest. Thank God. The president comes to a significant conclusion. This has gone too far. If you'd listened to me, none of this would ever have happened. I'm not the one blasting our private life for all the world to see. You're the reason she... Nora moans, or groans. They stop bickering. Lord, please let nurture win, because nature isn't doing us any favors. Men like Rooney feed on weakness. This isn't about Rooney. Punching the nose is too good for that slime. Put him down like the rabbit dog he is. Everyone is appalled. Listen to yourself. 
That's not who I am, Mom. In politics, you play to win. This isn't a game. It's her life. And it's a parent's duty to make it a good one. Interior of Victoria's campaign headquarters day, Victoria posters and long desks decorate the cluttered bullpen. Volunteers bustle and phones wail. On her iPad, Donna plays Victoria a campaign ad full of patriotic music, soaring eagles, and American flags. Jesus Christ, it's gutless. Where's the fire and brimstone? It's an ad for the president. He pulled every attack ad. Playing the sympathy card. Public ain't gonna see it that way. Victoria offers her a phone. Donna doesn't take it. They'll see what I want them to see. How much did you make at Carnegie? What's that got to do with the price of beef in Amarillo? How much? 200 grand. Great pay. How much would a man make? Point taken. We can't worry about hurt feelings. We're fighting for something bigger. If you overplay your hand, there's no turning back. Victoria puts the phone in Donna's hand. I only play the cards I'm dealt. Interior Camp David Laurel Lodge Day. A rustic conference room overlooking autumn foliage. Staffers plug away at banquet tables lined with laptops. The president occupies one debate podium, a Victoria stand-in 40s, the other. Carter supervises from the back. I'm not going to beat around the bush. He's got a small dick. You expect to satisfy them? You can't satisfy me. Staffers giggle. Come on, Carter. I wouldn't put anything past her. The president shakes his head. Let's go again. If his wife can't trust him, why should you? We've built credibility through bipartisanship and diplomacy. Oh, hold up. <laughs> he scampers to the front of the room. What now? Campaigns are my life. <laughs> so believe me when I say she will come at you. Now's not the time to be passive. He calls up polling data on his iPad. Mondale, Dukakis, Bush, Romney. He summons all his courage. Wimps just don't win. Staffers eye each other nervously. The President of the United States doesn't rot like a pig in the mud. Look at you. You're covered in shit, uh, sir. The president brings his full intimidating height to bear. She's still my wife. And she's kicking your ass. Ding, buzz, ring. Every laptop and cell phone sounds off. On Carter's iPad, Arisa, the president's mistress, stands in front of a solid colored wall, a setting as conservative as her outfit. My name is Arisa Thompson. You've heard a lot of nasty things about me. I'm here to set the record straight. This is my daughter, Layla. Layla, 13, rolls her motorized wheelchair into frame. We met Mr. President Livingston at a Muscular Dystrophy Association fundraiser. He was so nice. He promised to take care of my medical bills. If I promise to take care of him. Mr. President, without treatment, I don't have long. Please don't break your promise. I'm Victoria Livingston, and I approve this message. In the lodge, the president is aghast. It's time you treat your wife the way she treats you. Interior presidential debate night. Two podiums, one moderator. Dramatic lighting. The audience crackles with anticipation. In politics... This is it. Two production assistants wheel third podium out. Poor Morris, forgotten by you, me, and the debate commission. Interior presidential debate, green room, night. Refreshments, a coffee table, couches, not green. Victoria studies a binder of notes. Call it a hunch, a premonition, who do whatever. You're being paranoid. I told you if you ran that ad. At worst, it'll be as usual passive-aggressive bullshit. Have a drink. I hope you're right. A knock on the door. Donna opens it. A process server, 30s, wearing sheriff's uniform and badge, clutches a document. Secret Service agents flank him. Victoria Livingston? I said no visitors. Her agents shrug, helpless. 
Are you Victoria Livingston? No, I'm James Livingston. She presents the document. You've been served. She snatches it and slams the door. What is it? Victoria flips pages. Well, I never. Annoyance gives way to giddiness. He's throwing in the towel. What? Victoria waves it over her head. Waving the white flag. Donna demands it. One glance sours her mood. Interior presidential debate night. At their podiums, Victoria's teeming with confidence. The president pensive. Morris present? Arisa sits in the front row, in the president's eyeline, not far from Nora, who'd rather be anywhere else. Two stark choices stand before you. On Morris, hey, what about me? A woman willing to fight for justice, virtue, and the voices of those who have been too long ignored. The architect of the new horizon. Or... She pivots to the president. A man who puts his own needs above those of his family and his nation. A coward who always chooses the easy escape over the righteous path. That, my friends, is no way to lead. I'm here to return power where it belongs to the people. Silence. Then a guttural roar from the audience. Cut to the president prepares to speak, but stops. As if reconsidering his opening remarks. His mind made up. There we were. 29 terrified 1Ls cowering in the divine presence of Mark Shapiro, Professor F., High Priest of Constitutional Law. Please, dear Lord, I prayed, if you're up there, let him call anyone but me. Lost in reverie. And then, Providence, his eye fell on a pretty little Texan. In the faces of my classmates, I saw relief, but I felt only shame. That's when you stood up and declared Marbury v. Madison is a disgraceful overreach of the judicial power. It was love at first descent. The crowd is moved, even Arisa, and especially Nora. Years, decades later, I realized what a fool I'd been. Love blinded me to the grasping, clawing demons that consume your soul. Demons seduced by the power of the presidency, by the power to achieve great ends using the most unholy of means. He nods to himself, relieved to finally lay it all there. With clear eyes, I finally understood what I'd become to you, a tool, the living, breathing key to your life's ambitions. Gone were shared intimacies, little winks and jokes, Pillow talk replaced by political talk, resolutions, bills, executive orders, your agenda above all. He challenges the audience and Victoria. Is it any wonder I would seek affection elsewhere? It's true. I should have been honest with you. We should have been honest with each other. But to err is human, to forgive divine. Victoria Livingston does not forgive, and I do not forget. You picked this battle, Victoria. Reap your reward. Cut to. That's not my position. How would, how would I know? You've had so many. Cut to. Morris struggles to get a word in edgewise, but... The fact that you'd veto my equal pay bill is proof positive you consider women second-class citizens. You married me. Cut two. Morris waves desperately, but... This is a woman Machiavelli would be proud of. She doesn't care who she screws over, including you. And when she doesn't get her way, she takes her ball and stabs you in the back. Cut two. Morris slumps over his podium. Cut to the debates off the rails. Victoria on the defensive. Face it, you don't have the answers. I'm the most experienced presidential candidate in 25 years. Where's all that experience got you? Into the White House, with the ear of the president. But no, you couldn't leave well enough alone. His every response riles her up more. Well, enough isn't good enough. Not when our country has real problems. Time's up. How will you 
solve the country's problems when you're blind to the ones in your own home. And whose fault is that? You're, you're so fixated on my faults, you're incapable of seeing yours. The next question is for... You want to control everything, but some things can't be controlled, not even by a president. All the power in the world, and you're too spineless to use it. Please, we need to... Because I won't put my needs above the nation's or my family's. Like when you fuck that woman? The audience gasps. <clears throat> Senator Livingston! For which I've apologized repeatedly. Was that for the greater good? The audience turns on her, especially Arisa, who stomps out. Senator, you're out of order. You don't know where to draw the line. You nearly got our pregnant daughter killed. There is much to blame. Let's get back to the issue. Plot my monetary policy. Victoria wheels in on the little weasel. No one cares, Wesley. You're not here to help America. You're here to settle a score. God damn right I am. You should know better than anyone. She produces the document for all to see. Otherwise, you wouldn't have come tonight with a divorce. More gasps. That's a private matter. And a hum of audience disbelief. Control yourselves? For what? To rattle me? Intimidate? Only you would be so cynical. Did you expect their sympathy? Votes? Enough. He twists the knife. Victoria, after all you've put our family through, divorcing you is the easiest decision I've ever made. Interior presidential debate backstage night. The president escapes the stage head bowed. Carter, exuding compassion, awaits him, but the president passes without a word. Sir? The president turns around. You told her what she needed to hear. Sadly, the president accepts this. From a side door, Nora charges backstage. Grim eyes flit away from her father's. His hand reaches towards her. Carter restrains him. Don't. She's picked her battle. In the background, Morris's entourage, his wife, greets him with a ratty rolling briefcase and shabby overcoat. Interior presidential debate green room night, Victoria and Donna bark at each other. Why in holy hell did you bring her? It was a goddamn ambush. Why didn't you warn me? You didn't listen. It's your job to make me listen. Victoria slaps the divorce onto the coffee table. Don't go flying off the handle at me. Don't tell me what to do. I'll come back when you're sane. She leaves. Victoria paces. She dumps the debate binder into a wastebasket. It tips over. She sets it right. It tips again. She kicks the damn wastebasket into the wall. The door flies open. Still not sane. But it's not Donna, it's Nora. She notes the wastebasket binder leaves scattered about. No shit. First, that ad... She picks the divorce off the table. But what on earth made you think this was okay? It's a prop, a ploy. Everything she says works Nora up more. Divorce isn't a campaign tactic. Your father is the one that says politics is personal. He's not just another opponent. I'm not the one in the wrong here. You never are. He attacked me. Because you attacked me. Get away from you. He hesitates. You. And I don't blame him. It's a gut punch to Victoria. You don't really feel that way. So tell me how I feel. You always do. What do you want from me? Nora thrusts the divorce at Victoria. Think about someone other than yourself for a change. Into your talk show studio day. The chat, like Kathy Lee and Hoda, but sober. A blonde and brunette host, both 40 shotgun questions at Victoria. We saw a different side of you the other night, didn't we? I don't think it's fair to pigeonhole any woman as two-dimensional. We're not cardboard cutouts. The studio audience isn't buying it. 
You said things some might characterize as risque. You accuse the president of manipulating voters' sympathy to garner support. Isn't that, to your husband's word, cynical? Victoria shows the divorce papers. I've known James 32 years. This is politics as usual. If he's so desperate to go, why play hardball? Cut to Interior White House First Lady's Office Day. To the astonishment of Victoria's staff, the president marches into Victoria's private office. Why not offer something to anything substantial? For example, the house? He drops a set of house keys onto her vacant desk. Or alimony. He signs and tears off a check. Back to Interior Talk Show Studio Day. Victoria flops the document on the table. It's a joke. What if it's not? If you lose, you're out of the White House for good. Victoria couldn't disagree more. Win or lose, I'm in. He can't govern without me. Now, that's all there is to it. Interior White House Blue Room night, the president and his female interviewers share an intimate conversation surrounded by lights, cameras, and producers. Is that all there is to it? Despite Victoria's every effort to tear me down, humiliate me, I refuse to play politics with our personal life. But if she needs proof our marriage is over, I'm ready to deal. Because it's obvious to anyone she doesn't give a damn about Nora or me. Victoria only cares about Victoria, and she only wants to win. What are you suggesting? No one that ambitious skates through life without a closet full of skeletons. He holds up a sheaf of documents. She funded her earliest campaigns with millions her father stashed in Switzerland. That's quite an accusation. It's only the beginning. He hands over the documents, peers into the camera, interior of Victoria's campaign headquarters at Victoria, nursing whiskeys with Donna in the dark on TV. Victoria, every day you don't sign those papers. We, I, will expose your secrets. You won't win. Give yourself a chance. In headquarters. Still think it's a ploy? Victoria throws back her whiskey. He really wants it. She removes the divorce and a pen from her purse, prepares to sign. Donna stops her. Is it what you want? Past. This is a phone to Victoria. Nora deserves to hear that from you. Exterior Washington, D.C. Calorama Neighborhood Day. A pleasant afternoon for campaign canvassing amid joggers and dog walkers. Hun, it's mom again. I'll try later. Nora managing a stack of leaflets and Henry toting a clipboard knock on doors. Sweetie, please call back. Nora rings the doorbell. Nora, we need to talk. A barrel-chested blowhard, Callum Rama, neighbor, 70s answers. Nora offers a handshake. Hi, my name is Nora Wagner. He doesn't accept it. I know who you are. I'm running for re-election. I'm voting for Rooney. Just as the door is about to slam in her face. May I ask why? Henry's glance pleads with her, let it go. Because he's right. I don't trust you. You're not one of us. You only got where you are because of your parents. And the way they mess around... I'm not sure you don't either. What, you gonna punch me too? Pleasure to meet you. He tugs Nora's arm, she shrugs him off. 
You think you know me? She pulls into Calorama neighbor's personal space. Henry, my parents, you have no idea what a Livingston's capable of. Let's go. I see it every day on my TV. Now get off my porch. Henry drags her away. And don't come back. The door thuds behind her. Who the hell does he think he is? A voter. Not one I won't. You represent lots of voters you don't want. Nora's cell rings. Caller ID. Mom. You can't keep ignoring her. I'm not. She jabs the end button. Interior hotel suite day. First class. Atop the unmade bed, a packed suitcase. Victoria leaves Nora a voicemail. By now, I'm sure you know more than you ever wanted to know about your mother. You're probably wondering why. A knock on the door distracts her. This isn't the way I wanted you to find out. Call me. She pockets the cell and trudges out, leaving the TV on. Victoria Livingston's in news to in town today. Montage, a series of hotel suites. Suitcase and unmade bed remain constant, while newscasts of a grimly determined Victoria change at each campaign stop. On TV, protesters wave anti-Victoria and pro-president signs. Is she a traitor or a patriot? Victoria dances in outlandish headdress. How many indignities can she endure? Each day brings more allegations. Victoria hosts, hoists a beer at Oktoberfest. DWI is expunged by her father. Victoria inspects a Mexican border crossing. An undocumented nanny. Victoria whispers in Senator Falco's ear. Sex for votes! Victoria waves at a rally. And yet, day after day, she puts on a brave face. Despite plummeting poll numbers, how does she do it? Victoria kisses the baby. President Livingston's campaign promises an election eve bombshell. End of montage. Interior automobile factory day. Victoria tours a truck assembly line with management. A host of journalists shuffle behind recording her comments. My budget will incentivize industry to invest in training so employees will remain competitive in the marketplace for years to come. A Boston Globe reporter pushes to the front of the crowd. Why won't you respond to your husband's allegations? Victoria turns to him just as a factory worker surges out from the assembly line. Because she deserves it. He throws flour in Victoria's face. Re-elect the president. Amid pushing and shoving, Secret Service tackles him. When all settles... You didn't answer my question. Victoria, a flowery white ghost, faces him. As I was saying, my husband's budget, while well-intentioned, doesn't do enough to protect American industry. Interior United States House of Representatives Day, the Speaker of the House 60s presides on the dais. Above him, members' names and votes light up the tally board. H.R. 1207, D.C. Statehood. Yeas and nays are ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. Nora's colleagues insert key cards. As a delegate, Nora can't vote. She nervously tears at her daily agenda. Crappy Republican flashes his key card at Nora. Next year. She crosses her fingers. Unless daddy's got dirt on you, too. He dials in his vote. No. Laughs and slithers away. Nora's cross fingers become the bird. One by one, green yes votes march across the tally board. Relief floods Nora's face. Her phone vibrates. Caller ID, office, she picks up. Yeah? Falco? For fuck's sake. Interior, Dirksen Senate office building, Falco's office day. Senator Falco, 60s, props 100,000, um, or props 1,000 Ferragamos on his imposing oak desk. Photos document a distinguished career. I'm not sure you comprehend just how big a deal it is to create a state out of thin air.
not from thin air. From a constitutionally mandated authorization under the jurisdiction of the Congress. Nora shifts in her chair. Yes. Which may yet require a constitutional amendment. I don't think that would be necessary. Don't matter what you think. It only matters what those bonehead justices up the street think. Right. Now, don't look so glum, Bella. I'm not unsympathetic to your cause. Every voter and every vote in this here Congress is special to me. Nevertheless, the committee needs certain assurances. She hates doing this, but... Such as Transcore? He laughs. Victoria really put a bug in your ear. She's been after that forever. No, doll. The only pipeline I care about is one of my own trousers. Excuse me? Not like mom, after all, are you? Could the rumors be true, or is he just goading her? I can respect that. Make me an offer. I don't do deals, Senator. Then you'll pass along a message? Tell Victoria it don't matter who's president, that equal pay bill is bad for my state. Yours, too. Interior White House President Study Day. In the background on TV, a news anchor analyzes video of a factory worker throwing flour on Victoria. In the study, begin intercut. Carter, Leon, and the president hover over the speakerphone. You're, you're hanging her out to dry. Do yourself a favor, Donna. Interior of Victoria's campaign headquarters, Donna, overworked and bedraggled, um, summons enough energy to make the jerk-off motion. Marcy giggles into phone. Who am I to tell her to give up the ghost? She's a woman who stands for what she believes in. Aren't you tired of defending her? Carter, bless your heart. Have her sign the papers, okay? Donna. The line is dead and intercut. Interior White House President study, Leon kills the dial tone. Nothing is ever easy with her. A martyr's gotta earn it. The president makes a few practice putts. Victoria wouldn't do that for show. It's precisely what she'd do. Games within games. No time for a crisis of confidence, sir. I know my wife. What if it's not politics? What if it's more? It's always politics. Interior Raber, Nora's office day. Nora and staffers gather around a TV. Senate debate on D.C. statehood. It's really happening. On TV, Senator Falco addresses the chair. Mr. President, I rise in support of District of Columbia statehood. In the office, Nora is thunderstruck. What did you do? Henry bounces in with champagne and flutes. You gotta see what's going on. Exterior United States Capitol Day, a throng of Washington Washingtonians celebrate waving handwritten signs with slogans such as, finally, goodbye DC, New Columbia equals New Union, and 51 forever. One even says, thank you, Representative Wagner. In the distance, cars honk. On the Capitol steps, Henry squeezes Nora's hand. Beautiful sight, ain't, ain't it? Falco sidles up behind them. Nora bristles. Democracy at work. Thanks in no small part to you. Your wife did the heavy lifting. Nora shudders. And it was well worth the wait. Falco wrangles Henry's neck. Funny guy. <laughs> this one's a keeper, but don't change, don't shortchange your mother-in-law. It was her grunt work got it in. Nora is not amused. Interior George Washington University Auditorium hallway. Nora is vengeance, biding her time, pumping herself up, scheming. Rooney's muffled voice carries over the PA. You're kidding yourself if you think this election is about policies. Frazzle, a frazzled late attendee 40s dashes into the building, beelines for the auditorium until he sees Nora. Nora's Secret Service agents step out from the shadows. God, the traffic. I tried. And parking. Sorry, I'm rambling. Miss Wagner, I can't tell you how much. I appreciate your support. That's that.
Nora resumes prepping, eyes closed. But sure, overlook the moral failings of my opponent and her family. Excuse me, I'm sorry, but... Nora's eyes snap open. Mom's last social security check. Contact my office. I tried, but... Crazy campaign, you understand. It won't matter because my record speaks for itself. Lady Tindy digs into her purse. Can I just give you... Secret Service draw their guns! The purse thuds to the floor. Nora doesn't notice. She's already slipped inside. Interior George Washington University Auditorium. High-tech but cozy with just enough floor space for local news cameramen. Rooney prowls the stage like a big cat marking territory. All heads turn when the back door slams. Well, speak of the devil. You come to prove me right? I've come to prove you're a demagogue, a liar, and a hypocrite. Girly, that's what head shrinkers call projection. Don't take it from me. Ask your constituents. Tim protesters strip off their coats, revealing Rooney doesn't represent me shirts. They line up at microphones. Isn't that cute? Because you voted for the Pinecrest development, I lost my house. And life's better for so many more. I was given 10 days to leave and 25,000 for a 150 grand house. Nora makes her way to the stage. Tell me, Chuck, is that how a real Washingtonian treats his neighbors? 100% legal. You got a problem, take it to court. Protester number two steps up to the mic. Um, I work in the mayor's office of community relations. You know my boss, Clyde Rooney, your nephew. You got him the job. While I run the office, he gets paid twice as much as me to watch Netflix all day. The Golden Girls, Alf, who's the boss? You can do better than this, sugar. Making fun of a slow adult. The crowd boos. <laughs> Perfect strangers, Charles in charge, Mr. Belvedere. I will call the cops. Poorly dressed protester number three strides toward the stage. Recognize me? I don't make a habit of looking in cardboard boxes outside liquor stores. I'm the doorman at your apartment. The one in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Booze grow louder. The one you paid 50 lousy bucks to keep quiet. You don't even bribe good. Nora's on stage. Now that's what I call entitled. So what? You planted a few malcontents. My constituents love me. The rest of the audience, 250 strong, shed their coats. All wear Rooney doesn't represent me tees. Interior Nora's Mercedes desk, Henry drives the Black Secret Service Suburban shadows them. That's when I showed him this. She opens her coat, revealing a t-shirt Rooney will never represent DC. Henry Peaks disapproves. I did what you wanted. I took the fight to him. It was childish. The news crews ate it up. That's not who you are. She makes puppy eyes at him. Cheer up, Charlie. You want to be a U.S. representative? Act like one. Exterior in Nora and Henry's townhouse night. The Mercedes swings into the driveway where a black suburban is parked. Nora's own detail pulls in behind. For fuck's sake. Prelap a pan sizzles. Interior Nora and Henry's townhouse kitchen night. On the stove, grilled cheese. Victoria stirs tomato soup. Nearby, a folder bearing the FBI seal. Make yourself at home. Spend the night. Why not? You seem to like other people's beds. Nora. Victoria isn't phased. She expected no less. Winston and Havarti, her favorite. When I was nine, shouldn't you be out campaigning? 538's got you at 25% and everyone thinks they're high. Henry objects, but... Letter. How'd you get Falco to back my bill? Because I damn well know you didn't give up yours. Did you screw him too? Maybe it's Rooney's right about you. Months of anger explode and one sharp slap across his face. Sweetie, Rooney's dead wrong. You have only the best of your father and me. Nora snaps up like snaps up a grilled cheese. 
You can't just waltz into my house and treat me like a child. You're right. Nora is taken aback. Thank you. All thought out, she droops into a chair at the table. You okay? Sore, but fine. Victoria cuts off sandwich crusts. Secretary of State. What? Falco. I offered him state. I suppose that's marginally better than the alternative. Henry ladles soup into bowls. Here, ladle me help you. He and Victoria serve dinner, join Nora at the table. Why well, I came, what you need to know. Take your time. She gathers herself. I'm drowning. Last thing I want is to drag you down with me. Nora appreciates her saying that, but... Even if this campaign weren't in a circus, it wouldn't change a thing Rooney said about me. That's not true. It's your job to kiss my boo-boos any... It's not your job to kiss my boo-boos anymore. I'm about to be a mom. I've got to figure things out on my own. Not on your own. Maybe it's best you do the same. Henry covers his wife's hand with his. Babe, we agreed. No, she needs to hear it. I don't know why you're hanging on, but whatever it is, you're letting Papa destroy you. You don't have to take the abuse. That word abuse shocks them. That's what it is. Divorce isn't an admission of defeat. What else does he have on you? Victoria gestures for the FBI folder. Henry gets it. When you were little, I thought it would be empowering to share my first campaign with you. James called it Kitty Lib. Everywhere we went, housewives were beside themselves. You were quite the charmer. But the men, the way they looked at me. She say, shakes off the memory. It was different then. My opponent, one of the nicer things he said, called me an unfit mother. Most nights I cried myself to sleep. And every morning your father, bless his soul, said the same thing. You can't give up a dream. Her facade cracks. Henry comforts her. But dreams are illusions. They cost nothing to have and a fortune to keep. He passes Nora the folder. Two months into the campaign. Inside, Nora finds medical paperwork and a fetal sonogram. She's staggered. Whose? His. Of course his. Did he? I never told him. Victoria's darkest secret, wellspring of her ambition, cuts deepest. But they did. I had to, you understand? It had to. It has to have meaning. Does it? Victoria doesn't know anymore. Exterior church voting precinct today. Snow flurries dust the ground. Campaign signs litter the lawn. Anti-abortion protesters wave disturbing posters. Dozens of reporters angle for a better view of the black suburban idling at the curb. Interior suburban day. Victoria and Donna take in the insanity outside. What are we waiting for? They're not going anywhere. Donna checks her phone. Apparently, neither is James. Exterior voting precinct day. A phalanx of Secret Service agents usher Victoria through the horde. Reporters' questions melt into a cacophony. Donna scuttles behind her head, wagging like a stern nanny. Interior voting precinct, a dank basement full of voting booths and gawking voters. Cameramen document the president signing the register. Carter relays info from a Secret Service agent. The First Lady's here. I had to make her register with me. I'll find a back door. The president ambles to a vacant booth. Interior voting precinct stairwell. At the foot of the stairs, the sign points to the poles. Donna turns the opposite direction. Don't want to cause a scene. <laughs> In this election? Victoria marches straight to the polling room. Interior voting precinct. Carter recons before venturing into the hallway. Coast is clear. Behind him, the president exits through the front door. 
uh, interior voting precinct hallway, the president's Secret Service detail escorts him, trailed by his media entourage. Carter scampers after him as Victoria rounds the corner face to face with her husband. Donna and Carter share a mortified glance. Silence, but for camera clicks and shoe scuffs as reporters crowd the two candidates. Ah, uh, Reggie went to Nora's. Click, click. She didn't think this would ever end. I bet. Click, click. She seems relieved. A lifetime of words left unspoken passed between them as cameras click, click, click. Well, good luck. I'll need it. They depart in opposite directions. Interior Victoria's Victory Party Night, a lavish ballroom, screens televised election night America. Supporters, primarily female, sway listlessly to smooth jazz. After recent events, optimism is in short supply. Even the Victoria banners seem to wilt. Inside Victoria's presidential suite, accommodations too extravagant for a campaign in disarray. Heavy snowflakes pelt the windows. Donna boosts staffers' morale with Atta Girls. She enters bedroom where Victoria scribbles on a legal pad. Don't go hog wild now. A couple pages of thanks is fine by me. You've been a good friend. Donna snatches up the pad. Jesus, what is this? A suicide note? No, it's a concession speech. I'll see which way the wind's blowing. Wind ain't nothing but hot air. Victoria opens a window. Snow whips into the room. Point made. Donna shuts it. She tears off the speech, folds, and pockets it. Long night ahead. Got that right. There's a commotion outside. Sweet's front door. Secret Service restrains an angry hotel guest, 40s, waving a room key. What's the ruckus? They promised you'd be out by 10. Agents drag him off. I'm calling Channel 5. Donna closes the door. Long night indeed. Into your president's victory party night. Chandelier to floor, the hotel barroom is luxe. Upbeat oldies get well-heeled donors on their feet. Inside the presidential suite, a triumphal scene. Staffers cheer every time election night America calls a state for the president. Room service wheels in a champagne cart. A staffer pops a cork and splashes bubbly over flutes. Carter slips a party hat on her head. Interior Nora and Henry suite night, not so much a suite as a two-room pull-out with minibar. Knock, knock. Henry jets his head into the hall. One minute. He dances to the bedroom doorway. Let's get ready to rumba. Listen here, buddy. Whatever happens, there won't be dancing. I'm ginormous. Whatever happens, don't jive me. You win. I never have to tango with Rooney again. She steps out, pregnant and stunning. He twirls her. Ooh, cha-cha. Interior Nora's victory party, more intimate than her parents' parties. Nora's rocks. Young revelers down test tube shots while Electronica pounds the small ballroom. A roar erupts when Nora and Henry appear on stage, clasped hands raised in victory. Confetti drifts from the ceiling. Inside Morris's victory party night, banjo music. Saggy banners say, Morris, a real Republican. The hotel ballroom, dated and no larger than Nora's, is nearly barren, but for Arisa and Layla, supporting the only candidate who hasn't betrayed them. Inside Morris's victory party, outer hall night, Morris's disheveled volunteers offer admission tickets to hotel guests and passersby for free. No one accepts. Inside Victoria's victory party, Election Night America calls Minnesota for Victoria. Optimism sweeps the room. Inside her presidential suite, cheers for Minnesota. Marcy high-fives the man at her side, none other than Rob Murphy, 40s, legislative affairs stud. With an accent this time. Ten electoral kisses from Murph to Mars, don't you know? Murphy plants ten kisses on her. He is smitten. I'm fired if anybody finds me here. I'll make it worth your while. Victoria and Donna emerge from the bedroom. Marcy hides Murphy from view. That's 152, ma'am. Bet you never guessed we'd been in Minnesota, did you? Long way from 270. 
Donna produces a concession speech. Hot air. She steps into a kitchenette and sets the speech aflame on the stove. No one expects a politician to be perfect. They just want someone to give it to them straight. In the background, Marcy sneaks Murphy from the suite. Inside the president's victory party night, weary supporters stumble to the exits. It's beginning to look like a very long night. Interior president's presidential suite, the champagne cart squats in the corner untouched. Frazzled staffers loosen ties. Who's got Nevada? I, I need numbers. The party hat staffer rushes over an iPad. Carter snaps the hat off her head. He cringes at the numbers. The president barges from his bedroom. Carter braces himself. What's the holdup? Some precincts, sir. Uh, you know how it is. I don't have time for a crisis of confidence. Carter's brave front cracks. Oregon looks like a, a lock. How about a state I didn't win by 10 last time? Colorado? Eight. Staffers eye each other anxiously. I cut the bullshit. What about Ohio? Carter consults his numbers. Too close to call. That's not what she says. On TV, Victoria wins Ohio. Interior, Nora's victory party night. A janitor sweeps out confetti. Nora and Henry slow dance a champagne bottle in his hand. Congratulations, Congresswoman. They look each other in the eye. Thank, Thank God, God it's over. over. They laugh. He drains the bottle. Interior, Nora and Henry sweet day. Buzz. Hung over Henry knocks a bottle over in search of the bedside alarm. Nora's fast asleep, remote control in hand. TV commercial. A happy family rides a roller coaster. Henry tugs. The remote won't budge without waking her. He checks his phone, bursting with missed calls and texts. Too many. He'll get them later. He staggers to the bathroom, digs in his kit until he finds Advil. Downs two with a palm full of water. Shambles to the door, fetches his complimentary newspaper, ventures a glance. Nora! Inside, their sweet later, Henry packs Nora Days, watches Election Night America, going strong 12 hours later. On TV, the Anderson Cooper S. Network star 50s pokes a touchscreen U.S. map, states colored yellow and blue. The map legend shows Victoria and the president have 269 electoral votes each. Morris, zero. The Electoral College has not deadlocked since 1828, which throws the election to the House of Representatives. As things stand... The touch shows a House diagram, majority Republican red. Republicans win the House by a razor-thin margin. But that may not matter. If this new Congress votes along party lines... At the news desk, a Democratic and Republican strategist, both 40s, paid absurd cash to contradict one another. This is a free country. No one's forced to vote by party. If Americans were as gullible as you think we are, we'd all be Democrats. Exterior hotel parking lot day. Henry throws in their luggage, slams their Mercedes trunk. Both President and Senator Levingston will carry 25 states. Remember, it's states, not representatives. Exterior downtown Washington day. The Mercedes powers through traffic tailed by a suburban. In the past, we've had constitutional crisis on our hands. Fortunately, there's a 51st state this year. Represented by Livingston's Democrat daughter. The Electoral College is a sham. Every vote should count. Typical Republican insist on strict rules until they favor the other guy. Exterior Norrin Henry Street day. Satellite trucks and news vans parked on both sides of the quiet residential street slow the Mercedes to a crawl. What a load of donkey manure. Interior of Victoria's presidential suite. Donna cleans up after last night. Victoria's in her robe, hanging on every word of election night America. On TV, Republican strategist pushes network star aside. Touch screen headline. What happens in the event of an electoral college tie? Below, graphics of all 51 states, their number of U.S. representatives printed within each border. At right screen, in large, vote, in large print equals one vote. Republican strategist circles California numbered 53. You're one of 53 Californians in the House. Your party's got... To win a majority, that's 27 races to get one stinking vote. Interior, Nora's Mercedes, the car drifts through the press thicket. 
And here's a girl who represents not even a state, a city, whose vote counts as much as all of California's combined. Henry turns up the driveway against the crush of reporters stampeding their lawn. Interior of Victoria's presidential suite day on TV. Tell me how that's fair. In the suite, Victoria shuts the TV off. Poor Nora. Imagine the pressure. She's in over her head. She might surprise you. She might fold. Interior, Nora and Henry's townhouse kitchen montage. In her maternity robe, hair a mess, Nora scoops coffee from a full bag. Peeking through shutters, she glimpses news crews set up morning remotes on the sidewalk, grabs orange juice from a full fridge. The bag is half empty. She peeks outside, wags her head as news crews trample the lawn. The fridge is half empty. Nora shakes the last grounds into a filter. She trashes the bag and peeks outside. Inches from her face, standing in the flower bed, a photographer steals a candid shot. Seriously, in Henry's petunias? She snaps the shutters closed and opens the fridge. Empty. End of montage. Interior White House Oval Office. The president spots a golf ball across the carpet. It clanks off the auto return gadget. Carter kicks it back. You can't let her steal this. The fate of the nation's at stake. Don't be so dramatic. I'm not. He's not. Mark my words, Victoria will do whatever it takes to persuade her. The president thuds another putt off the rim. Nora represents... Nora resents me enough as it is. Uh, allowing her to make this decision on her own, sir, it's too risky. No. Interior grocery store day, Nora inches her overflowing cart down the health and beauty aisle. Her secret service agents do their best to protect her from the army of cameramen, print reporters, and the stylish woman from Red Book Magazine 30s. She's got a good head on her shoulders. All Nora wants is to get the hell out of here. Have you spoken to your parents? Have either offered you a part in their administration? What do you until the house wants to announce your decision? Nora's pregnant belly bludgeons a path to the adult diaper shelf, reaching for the store brand. Ooh, I don't know about that one. Incontinence is messy business. Mortified, Nora grabs the pins instead. Surprise, surprise. Store brand's good enough for us little people, but not daddy's special snowflake. Nora's old foe barrels down the aisle, basking in the reporter's attentions. Are we really gonna trust a girl this worried what people think to pick our next president? He tosses a store brand diaper into his cart. Interior exterior Nora's Mercedes Day. Nora, stifling tears, darts through Washington traffic. Motorcycle paparazzi, driver and photographer riding pillion, race past a Secret Service Suburban and pull even with Nora. The photographer whips out his camera. Nora jams the gas, hurtling through a yellow light. In her rear view, the motorcycle fades behind. Ahead, red stoplight, red taillights. Nora slams the brakes. Groceries scatter across the back seat. Tires squeal. She rear ends the car. Exterior road day. Police and Secret Service confine hustling paparazzi and news cameramen to the side. A tow truck winches the total Mercedes onto its flatbed. Exterior ambulance day. Nora sits propped up on a stretcher. In their panicky hunt for any sign of life, her groping hands prevent the EMT from securing the stethoscope to her belly. Finally, Nora feels something, exhales. It's kicking, thank God. Satisfied uh, with what she hears, the EMT packs up. A cop 40s returns no Nora's driver's license with a ticket. Next time, keep your eyes on the road. Through red-rimmed eyes, she gapes at the ticket. But I've got immunity. She digs into her purse for congressional ID. My apologies, ma'am. He examines the photo. Recognition dawns on him. So, you're going to pick a side or what? Exterior Nora and Henry's townhouse night, a black suburban caroms up the driveway, scattering reporters camped on the lawn. And inside of their townhouse living room night, Nora, weighed down by grocery bags, drags herself through the side door. She faces Henry, drained. Babe. He throws his arms around her. Bags tumble, spilling groceries across the floor. 
He snatches up the Depends package at his feet. Since when did you stop depending on the cheap ones? She bursts into tears. What did I say? Interior White House Oval Office, a who's who of Washington insiders, Speaker of the House, Minority Leader 60s, Senate leaders, uh, White House counselors, chattering like anxious schoolboys and girls, all come to attention when the president pokes his head in. Thank you all for coming. A couple minutes, if you don't mind. Interior White House West Wing Hallway, continuous, Lean offers the president a folder with presidential seal. Bite the bullet, sir. The president accepts it reluctantly. Leon leads him towards the president's study down the hall where Carter awaits him. Upon seeing the folder... I know it doesn't feel like it, but it's the smart play. The president runs. Any idea what she's going to do? Hopefully, the right thing. Not what the president expected. And Victoria? Phil and I heard with pretty promises, I presume. Election, HUD, HHS, God knows. Interior White House President Study Continuous, Victoria and Nora rehush when the president enters. I uh, didn't mean to interrupt. Their silence demands he lead the conversation. Well, uh... He withdraws a bill from the folder. The New Columbia Economic Recovery Act offers it to Nora. Seriously? And what have you got for me? Victoria spreads empty hands. The president removes another bill from the desk drawer. This one for Victoria, the Equal Pay Act, fresh and new. We'll pass it next term, won't we? You wouldn't have the votes. That's the job, isn't it? Victoria is genuinely touched, nevertheless. I can't accept this. Jesus Christ, you're going to fight this to the bitter end. You have to do what's best for you. She removes the divorce papers from her purse, presents them to the president. Nora's eyes well up, her voice quivers. Mom. The president runs a finger over Victoria's signature. You could have. Weeks ago. But he knows it's not true. So, what now? You have to choose. Nora collects herself, glances from father to mother. That's all? The president is equally curious. That's all. Interior White House Oval Office Day, solemn and ceremonial. Washington's high and mighty part for the procession, the president, Victoria, and Nora. Nora waddles to a lone, hard chair set aside for her. The president spies his putter, hides it behind his desk. Your show, Mr. Speaker. Speaker and minority leader, step forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Livingston, distinguished guests, we think it best for all concerned not to drag this out so we can begin the transition as soon as possible. If you're ready, Representative-elect. Nora shifts uncomfortably in her seat. We've canvassed the Republican caucus and count 25 states to the senator. We show 25 for President Livingston. How will New Columbia vote? The fate of the nation and her family rests squarely on Nora's shoulders. She inhales sharply, her face pales, the room shrinks. Mom? Gasps. Victoria's flabbergasted. Congratulations, ma'am. Nora white knuckles the arms of her chair. Whatever you need. Excited conversations merge into white noise. In the middle of it all, unnoticed, Nora hyperventilates. Over the hubbub. Papa! Surprise gives way to confusion. Well, what is it? I move for a recount. Nora's frantic eyes scour for. Henry? Exterior Pennsylvania Avenue, uh, Northwest Day, a phalanx of wailing police cru cruisers and Secret Service suburban speed the presidential limo through Washington. Inside the hospital room, sirens are replaced by the cries of Baby Wagner. Zero. Nora cradles her daughter. Proud Papa Henry tucks his pinky into her tiny fist. Victoria and the president admire their first grandchild. She's got your ears. And your mouth. Victoria takes the president's hand. If only for one fleeting moment they agree. This is what matters. Prelap, the baby's bawling continues. 
Exterior United States Capitol Day. Wrapped in her warmest swaddle, Baby Wagner uh, wriggles in Henry's arms. Victoria wipes the snowflake from her head and slips her a pacifier. We pull back, losing them in a sea of shivering bodies on the inaugural platform. On the day is, the Chief Justice administers the oath of the office. Next to her, Nora holds the Bible. I, James Albert Livingston, do solemnly swear. And farther, as far as the eye can see, buzzing Americans crowd the National Mall as we fade out the end. Wow, that's... I have it muted. I think something's wrong with our air horn. It's like on a little bit of a delay for me. All right, cool. So that was Bedroom Politics by Ben Koch. Thank you so much, Ben, for submitting your script. Thank you, everybody. Did a great job. Let's start with Kat. What were your thoughts on the script? Oh, me. I'm so surprised. <laughs> it's always you. It's always me. I need to change my name. Well, thank you so much for submitting writer uh you read something 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 had a great time reading went surprisingly fast considering how long it was um it was like two and a half hours to read nearly 120 pages amazing so i mean that's pretty good pacing i have to say um i only made a couple of notes and they were quite early on uh although i did have a little bit of confusion around the end so i'll just jump right in um what are eggplant balls? <laughs> I'm, I'm vegetarian and I've never heard of eggplant balls. Um, and nutmeg and bechamel, that doesn't sound right. Uh, I think, uh, is it page 15, shoe in? I don't think it's like shoe in as in go away. I think it's a shoe in as in the shoes you wear on your feet. So it's just like the one typo that I noticed because I don't really know it's typos. Um, I also made a note around there that the narration seemed a little bit conversational, but I either got used to it or you toned it down towards the end because I didn't really, I kind of got I stopped worrying about that. Well, it does look nice. Um, <laughs> sorry, somebody posted a picture and say we reach out. Um, I think we need a little bit more information about Nora because I got super confused as to like, is she like a student or how old is she? And she's like pregnant. I don't know. I got, I, I just got really confused. I think, I think you need a little bit of clarification somewhere on her character, but maybe, maybe just having her, having a visual to look at and an actual person there will clear up any confusion that I was having. Um, and yeah, I got a little bit lost at the end everything got a little bit complicated and um victoria who was the protagonist up until about page 80 just kind of stopped talking seemed like a, it went from a lot to a little um which isn't necessarily a problem i just kind of felt like who, who are we who are we watching now but i really like the way that you um you had sort of people you had victoria being the person moving behind and then she was kind of challenged in a way that was that made her challenge herself, which I really liked. I thought you did that really well because um, it gave a little bit of depth and conflict to that character. And that's all I have really. Like I said, I had a good time. I um, liked the few jokes that you put in it. Um, that's it really. Thank you so much again for letting us read. Keep on submitting. Word. Keep on submitting. Yeah, Ben, um, we did a previous script by Ben what was it now uh amazon something like 39 days in the amazon or something like that so this is actually his second script um but that was a long long time ago that we did that one um our next person is script chick but i'm just going to give her a quick rest because she was narrating so I'll, i'm going to give a tiny bit of feedback myself um so first of all i I'm curious if it's supposed to be like a lifetime movie because I didn't find it like entertaining enough to be more than that. Uh, it was really just, I don't know, it felt small to me. Um, and if it's supposed to be a lifetime movie, then it's probably good for that. Uh, I don't know the song. <laughs> you reference a song that, you know, I think it's dangerous to say this, this dialogue is said you know the way that this song is sung unless it's a song that everybody knows 
And uh, that's a situation where I would like do a poll of like 10 people, 10 of your friends and say like, how many of you know what this song is and what I mean by this? And if the majority don't know it, don't do that. Um, because you do it multiple times in the script for how they say Victoria. And I, I was totally lost. Um, I found the, the cursing to be a bit jarring when it came up. Uh, I guess because I was thinking it was like a Lifetime movie. And then when someone started dropping F-bombs, I was like, oh, it felt out of place to me. But maybe that's just me. So that might just be, you could ignore that one. Nora's uh, storyline threw me off. Uh, and I think Kat touched on it a little bit there. Uh, I feel like we should be on Victoria, you know, the whole time, basically. And whatever Nora's job was or whatever, it just totally went over my head. Uh, and I think it made things too complicated. Um, it seemed unrealistic to me how unprofessional they were during a debate. Uh, although I'm a Canadian and... I'm super not interested in politics. I just found it really unbelievable that that wouldn't be like that people wouldn't put a stop to that immediately um, because it seems like something that Americans take pretty seriously. Um, and there was a lot of tell rather than show in the action lines, which I'm sure other people noticed as well. And I, I, I don't think it's okay, uh, and I know some people will probably say this is like a style thing and it's fine and it's like, you know, writer's preference or whatever, but so many times you would say what the character is feeling by writing it in the action line rather than showing it with their reaction or what they said or, you know, what they did or how they looked or whatever, and it just bothered me. Um... Uh, all that aside, I think you're a really good writer and, uh, I, you know, I don't know. I think personally, like I hate to be negative is just maybe not, it just wasn't for me. I think it was, um, just like not entertaining enough. And, uh, I don't really watch lifetime movies. So if it's meant to be a lifetime movie, I apologize, but I'm so sorry to be negative. I usually really, really try to be positive. Um, but it's probably just because it's politics, man. It's politics. I'm going to stop there. Um, script chick. <laughs> I hope I gave you enough of a rest there. What were your thoughts on the script? Thanks, Mish. Had a great time. <laughs> um, I did not write down that many notes because uh, I was narrating. But uh, let's see what my little chicken scratch drummed up. Um, thank you, Ben, by the way, for submitting um, I definitely noted that I liked dialogue on page 14, 30, and 69. So before you rewrite anything, go back to those pages and appreciate that I really liked stuff that was on there. In 69, I said, love at first descent. I thought that was really clever. Um, but yeah, it was, it was dialogue for me there that I really appreciated. Um, I am just wondering, uh, you know, I know the president gets a call on his phone, but it's kind of actually a while after that press thing on the news about um, Arisa or about his infidelity. So um, that just seemed kind of unbelievable to me that that would go on for so long uh, or that they wouldn't get to the president and let him know that that shit was about to go down, uh, like that he had to find it out way long after... Um, his daughter and his wife. So I didn't really buy that moment personally. Um, let's see, um, gosh, I can't read. Uh, oh, I don't, this is small. I don't know if the shocker joked work worked for me on page 38. Um, it seemed kind of crude compared to everything else you got going on. It just seemed a little bit too sophomoric for what you had already established. Um, I liked Henry's puns to a point, and then I thought, oh, he's just kind of like a one-trick pony of just like a punster, and I got kind of tired of it. Um, let's see. Uh, I I thought I liked Falco. I thought he was an interesting character in, in, to introduce. 
But when you have a script like this that has so many people and talking heads, yes, Captain Falca, um, so many talking heads, uh, you know, the fact that they are mentioning him early on I, and then for us to not see him until around page 80, like that kind of whole setup was lost because I would have forgotten him by then. It, I think it would take a little bit more for me to get back into it. Um, uh, yeah, um, I definitely agree with Kat and uh, Smish about the whole Victoria thing. Um, yeah, I, I just think that it should be her and not... Um, you know, there is a heavy focus on Nora, which I mean is good, but it was just kind of jarring to me the direction you're actually going with this story. Um, but yeah, um, I think politics can definitely be interesting. I just have seen House of Cards and um, uh, The Good Wife, some of The Good Wife. And for me, those kind of speak, you know, The Good Wife speaks a lot of the setup you already have. So I don't know reader going into it if they have bias with that. Um, and just your tone too, because you have kind of funny bits, but it doesn't really commit. Um, you know, with the showing the pink underwear, stuff like that, that just doesn't seem to be tonally consistent with the movie that I was hearing up until that point. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'll pass it on to other people, but um, definitely agree though with Kat and Smish's comment about uh, the Nora switch. Cool. Thank you so much, Script Chick, and thank you again for narrating. That was a longer than usual one. Much appreciated. But not too long. 117 is not too bad. Uh, and last on our list, but most important, the president, Cheddarman. What were your thoughts? Well, first of all, I want to thank Ben for submitting the script. Uh, I thought it was very well written, but I uh, I just had a hard time getting into it because politics, like as soon as politics come up, my brain just kind of turns off. <laughs> but I thought I thought that the uh, the characters were were pretty well rounded and fleshed out. But uh, yeah, I mean, the whole relationship between the president and Victoria seemed to hinge on politics so much throughout most of the script and it wasn't until the very end they kind of started to have like an actual real relationship and i kind of would have liked to see more of that because that almost seemed like the theme of the whole thing to me just so yeah just kind of get more of that uh realness between them because it was kind of very brief um yeah. Um, someone else mentioned, I think it might have been Smish, that the uh, action lines were kind of conversational. And I, I thought it was fine, except uh, on page 18, when it says Nora can't even. I think as colloquialisms go, that one's a little bit too internet. And, uh, you know, it just kind of won't age well, I think. You know, those kind of things... They come and go very fast. Um, and yeah, there was something else. Hang on, let me scroll. Scrolling. You still scrolling there, Chad? All right, never mind. I can't find it. <laughs> no, um, we got all day, man. We'll wait. You scroll. <laughs> no, it's all right. <laughs> okay. Is that is that the, that's all your feedback then? Um. Yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, man. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you so much again to Ben and to all my table readers um you can now sign up to be a table reader for next week's script if you're a member of our discord group just go to the casting couch channel and type dot i volunteer the uh, script for next week's table read will be announced on monday morning uh, and the video for this table read will be up on our website at twitchtablereads.com within the next day or two uh, so that is it for our show. Say goodbye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Goodbye, goodbye citizens everybody. of the U.S. 
Goodbye. Goodbye, my fellow Americans. America. America. Bye.